We're going to be 1 Samuel 10, starting off in verse 17. And it reads, Now Samuel called the people together to the Lord, to the Lord at Mizpah, and he said to the people of Israel, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt and delivered you from the hands of the Egyptians and from the hands of all the kingdoms that are oppressing you. But today you have rejected your God, who saves you from all the calamities and distresses. And you have said to him, set a king over us. Now, therefore, present yourself before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands. Then Samuel brought all the tribes of Israel near, and the tribe of Benjamin was taken by Lot. He brought the tribe of Benjamin near by its clans, and the clan of the Matrites was taken by Lot. And Saul, the son of Kish, was taken by Lot. But when they sought him, he could not be found. So they inquired again of the Lord, is there a man still to come? And the Lord said, behold, he has hidden himself among the baggage. Then they ran and took him from there. And when he stood among the people, he was taller than any of them. He stood, stood taller than any of them from his shoulders upwards. And Samuel said to all the people, do you see him whom the Lord has chosen? There is none like him among the people. And all the people shouted, long live the king. Then Samuel told the people the rights and duties of the kingship, and he wrote them in a book and laid it before the Lord. Then Samuel sent all the people away, each one of them to his home. Saul also went home at Gibeah, and with him went men of valor whose hearts God had touched. But some worthless fellows said, how can this man save us? They despised him and brought him no present, but he held his peace. Um, so I appreciate what, uh, what Drew had shared last week um, about this story, about how it, it was a, first a private anointing of Saul um, into, into this kingship, but, and overall the message being that he was chosen by God. Um, that today, um, regardless of where we stand, we too are chosen by God, and it was incredible. Um, I wasn't here, but I got to listen to it. Um, but today, we, we kind of get to see the public portion of this anointing, where he's supposed to be standing before people, but instead we see him hiding. Um, a great way to start off this, this kingship is hiding in baggage. And, but I think what is, what's so, I, I find it's, it's, this to be a very funny passage to me. Have you guys seen The Office before? So I imagine that like if Saul was, like this Michael Scott character, then you know him being in the baggage and luggage was would be like comedic. And we see that there are two kind of groups of people who have different responses. Um, there, are, there's this one group who yells, "Long live the king!" And this, I, I imagine that these people are like the Dwights. You know, they're the people who they support Michael Scott. Michael Scott being like the boss of the office. Um, and there's the other group who are talking about how man, this Paul guy is going to, the Saul guy, is going to ruin, ruin this kingdom. And I, I imagine those are people like the Stanleys. Can't stand Michael at all. Hate, hate all his charades, all his, all his jokes. Um, but we kind of see that this is, this is the first response uh, to Saul and his anointing. And what I find interesting about this is that Saul hasn't really done anything yet. But they've already kind of have a verdict on what kind of king he's going to be. Um, see, yeah, again, we see like the, there's just one group who are saying like, "Long live the king," as if he's already done great, great things for the kingdom. But all they've seen is him hiding at this point. And we see this other group saying, "Oh man, he's going to ruin all of Israel." And again, he hasn't done anything yet. So how can we, how can they come to this, this idea and this verdict of what kind of king Saul is supposed to be? And we could take time to kind of speculate, okay, which group was right. I don't think either of them were completely right or wrong. Um, under King Saul's leadership, we see the coming of David and Solomon, two of Israel's mightiest, mightiest kings. Um, 
in their time. So sure, maybe the people who were saying long live the king were right, but even the people who were saying, oh, he's gonna ruin the kingdom, they weren't completely wrong either. We see only a hundred years later, Israel kind of splits and we see two lines of kings after that. But my big question for us today and the title of my lesson is what is our verdict? What is our verdict? And I want to kind of explain that a little bit. Um, because we see that people, these people haven't seen who Saul is yet. Yet, they have kind of made a verdict about what kind of king he is going to be. And as an outsider looking in, it's confusing. It's, it's like, I, it raises questions for me about, okay, where, where do these people trust? Like, do they, are they so quick to assume that he's going to be an amazing king? Are they so quick to assume that he's going to be this awful Israel destroying king? Where's their trust? Because it obviously wasn't in what Saul had done or what he was doing. Because he just got there. And when I think about how they approached God about this, I don't think it was ever God's intention for them to kind of come to a verdict about the kind of king Saul was going to be. Again, as, as Drew was preaching, like, he was chosen by God. And that should have led them to trust, trust that, man, God, God had a plan behind what he was doing. I don't think God wanted them to come to this verdict because what we see is that they're putting that trust so much more in and saw and who he was as a person versus, man, who God is and how he chooses who's going to reign. As the kids would say nowadays, they kind of failed the assignment. They, 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 they missed kind of the point of, of Saul's anointing here. And they started off strong. And it's really, it's, it's interesting because we see that, yes, they, they acquired, inquired of the Lord. They took time to, to meditate on this decision and to look to see which of the candidates, who is, who is God selected. But we see that the moment that Saul comes onto the scene, it's all about Saul. That one, at one point they were praying and they were looking to God for the answer. But the moment Saul came into the picture, they had lost all sight of, of God in this, uh, in this. It became, okay, what is Saul gonna do for this kingdom? What is Saul gonna do for us? Will he be that savior that, as, as a nation of Israel, we all longed for? And we're gonna come back to that for a second, but I want us to take time now just to consider for ourselves. Uh, this is an exercise I've loved to, I've done with a few of the campus students, and um, that as we read scriptures that are like a story, trying to identify ourselves as characters in that story. So maybe, maybe it's a Samuel, maybe it's a Saul, maybe it's one of these groups of people. I want us to take time meditating and thinking through, okay, who am I in this story? And I think personally, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna try to be just very vulnerable about who I am and kind of even my experience with like campus ministry um, thus far. And being on campus, I think, especially last semester, I felt very alone. Um, and it wasn't necessarily because of anything people had done, um, but with, with Phil going through his cancer treatments, um, I had, I think coming in, I had this expectation that, man, me and Phil are going to spend every waking hour together and he's going to be on campus walking alongside of me. It's going to be so exciting. But the reality was that he, he was going through chemo. He wasn't able to, he was, he physically was not able to be on campus with me. Um, and I knew that the other, you know, the other staff guys were, were there to help me and pick up, um, I think, all the areas that I needed help with. But I think at that time, I had allowed Satan to lie to me. I had been convinced that because of the scenarios and because of the situations, I was alone. I had nowhere to go. So when it came to leading Bible studies, leading discussions, discipling brothers, I didn't go to anybody. I was convinced that there was nobody I could talk to, there was nobody I could go to 
because I was all alone. So when I think about kind of that situation and where I am, I find myself to be like one of these people, um, one of the Israelites who is saying, Paul's going Paul's gonna to ruin, ruin Israel, the Stanley character in this story. Because I think when I, when I was convinced of Satan's lie, I had already come up with this kind of verdict for, my, for, for myself. I was already convinced that there was nobody I could talk to. That when God brought me here, he didn't want me to lean on other people. He wanted me to go off on my own. And that's, kind of, that's what that process was. You know, I was looking at a situation in my life that kind of lends itself to one of these characters in the story. So I want to ask you guys, who are you? Who are you in this story? I think it's going to be slightly different for all of us. But who are you? And I, especially like as I'm reading the story, I don't want to make, to make it out as like that everybody in the story is a bad guy. I think these were very genuine people. Um, and I, I appreciate what was shared about in the community message today about how, yes, like our sin doesn't define us at all. Um, I, I, I don't want kind of their, these people, these Israelites, sin to, to define them and who they were um, as a people. Um, we're, ultimately, we're all lost without Christ, amen? But when I look at these people, um, you know, the Dwights and the Stanleys, um, they were, none of them were intentionally trying to kind of overthrow who God was. Um, they'd gotten distracted by the coming of Saul and who Saul was going to be. And I, I just imagine that these were, these were people who were excited, that they, they saw this coming of a king, and they were like, wow, like, imagine all that Saul's going to do for our kingdom. How exciting. Long live the king. And the other side, the people who were more skeptical about the coming of Saul, I imagine that they had families, friends, who they just wanted to see the best. So when they saw this, nobody saw picked out just because he's, he's tall and we see him now hiding in, in luggage, like, I imagine, I, I'd be concerned. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, like, <laughs> who is this guy? He's supposed to, supposed to lead us? He's supposed to take us back to God? No, like this is, this is not right. This is, this is the end of, of Israel for us. So yes, we, in verse 22, we do see them all inquire of the Lord. But when Saul came out, there was this demeanor change where they did began focusing on, on Saul. That their eyes were on God for a moment, but then it shifted to, to man and what man can do. And I think that's, that's the tension that I'm trying to bring light to. And again, they were inquiring of God, but they were doing so for the sake of finding a new king. And I think that's, that's, that, that's the problem there, is that they inquired of God, but they already had this verdict. They had a decision in mind that they needed a new king. Whereas God... His hope would, would be that he was their king. Not that they were looking elsewhere for, for a king or looking elsewhere for, for salvation, but no, they, that they would turn to God. So as they inquired of God, they already had a decision in mind. That was their verdict. They, they already knew that we needed, we, we know what we need. We need a king. Because we look at the, the countries around us, they are all king and queen led. And look how it is for them. That's what we need. Rather than inquiring, about, inquiring of God about, man, God, what do we need? What do we need from you? They're trying to find this, this perfect solution in, in people and in things that aren't going to give them that perfect solution. God was the king they needed and the king that they've, they needed the entire time, but they were looking elsewhere. 
I think just like the Israelites, we often try to fill this God-sized hole in our heart, looking elsewhere, looking to people to fill that hole. But king, but God is that king that we all long for, that we need. Are we praying to God and talking to God? Like the Israelites inquiring of God? Because we already know what we need? Or because God's already our king? That's the question I want to ask us today. Why are we inquiring of God? Is it because he's our king? Or because we already know what we need and we're asking for it? And I think in my, in my example earlier, um, I became very self-reliant. I wasn't going to people for help. I wasn't asking for help. Instead, I was going to God for the sake of my pride. I would, I would say, yeah, like I, I prayed to God about my ministry. Um, and it had that to be a justif justification for why I didn't need more help. Man, I was praying. I was praying every day. I was praying a lot. Because in my logic, you know, why should I talk to these people who are so busy, who would have to strain to try and meet me where I'm at? If I already know that, like, oh yeah, all I need, all I need to do is pray, I'm good. That's all I needed. That was my verdict. Was that, no, I didn't need other people. I just needed to pray harder. I needed to spend more time on campus, even though that was failing. So I ask us again today, what is your verdict? Do you already know what you need? Or are you going to God as your king, asking him what, what he wants from you, what, he, what you need? And today I want, this, I want this to be a challenge for us, to be able to really think through why we're inquiring of God. Because God is God who will always, always give us what we need. He knew that, yes, they, the Israelites weren't going to hear it, and they needed a king, and he, he, he brought that. But ultimately, it was for the sake of bringing him all back to God. So as people, like naturally, yeah, we do fall short. We're proud. We put up idols and all these kings before God, but he is so gracious to each and every one of us, and he gives us what we need. Um, I'm sorry, I lost my place. Um, but I, I imagine these, these are people that, they were super supportive of, of Paul, and um, which, is, which is incredible because I think we get to see kind of how, how these people were, were led by, by, you know, God gave them Saul, and they were led, um, led well by him. Um, But at the same time, there's still those people who are like almost bad mouthing, bad mouthing Paul or Saul. I keep mixing up their names. Um, but I think what we see in that is that, regardless, we see that Satan's right there. We see that, and he, I think he does the same thing in our lives, where no, he doesn't want us to inquire of the Lord. He wants us to come to our own assumptions, to to our own beliefs. He says, don't, don't talk to God. Like, you've, you've already talked to God. You've already talked to other people. You're good. You don't need to anymore. He, and ultimately, he wants us to be surrounded by people who don't have valor. And that's, that's, that's the next big point I want to talk about is that in, the, in this exiting of Saul from this anointing, he is surrounded by men of valor. And as, as God being a God that gives us what we need, Yes, he gives us people. He knew that Saul as a man was going to fall short. That he was going to need help. He was going to need help leading a nation of Israel. God knew, oh, those Israelites, they're they going to need some help. It's going to need more than just, just Saul. Man, you're going to need people of valor, people of courage to walk alongside you. But again, Satan's right there trying to pull us, pull us away from those people. He's saying that you don't need those people. 
So what, I imagine that's, that's what Saul was wrestling with when he was being badmouthed. Like, these people were saying, oh, he's going to destroy Israel, and he's not going to be a good king for us. Man, I, I imagine that Saul there would not have kept his peace or composure if he wasn't with those people of valor, if he didn't have those people around him. I think that's a similar lesson to what I've had to learn doing campus is that, man, I just need people so desperately. Not only on campus, but even for our walk with God. This is, our walks with God weren't something meant to, to be done alone. But we're supposed to be reliant on other people. And God being the gracious God that he is, has given us so many amazing people. You take a second to look around at these people. This church, this fellowship. God knew that you needed these people in this room today. And he brought them here. That's just how gracious God is. And I know I've done a lot of talking about, you know, these, these Dwights and these Stanley characters and kind of, this, there's lots of ideas here. But ultimately, there's just two big things I want us to be able to walk away with. Is one, inquiring of God, not because we know what we need, but because God knows what we need. And two, is that we need other people to help. And these are the, these are the two big messages I, I see in this passage that I want us to be able to walk away with. So I imagine that in our lives today, and if we're able to hold on to these two major points, man, how different would this fellowship look? I imagine that there'd be a lot less conflict. That when we're all inquiring of the Lord in our decisions, that even when there is conflict, we're actively trying to kick Satan out of that picture. We're able to focus on the unity that we're, that we're trying to build. I think we feel a whole lot less lonely when I'm actively trying to pull people in, pull people of great courage and valor around me so that when I'm on campus, I don't feel as alone. I don't feel like I have any, nowhere to go. But man, like God is, God is providing and he's so intentional about who he's provided for each of us. I think about our, just our daily lives would be so contagious that man, when we're inquiring of God and have people around us, People are going to see that and be so inspired by our lives. Because, man, we're not, we're not relying on, on other people. We're not making these, these kings and idols. We're so focused on, man, God, what do, you, what do you want from me? What do I need? Who are the people that you've placed in my life very intentionally that I need to talk to, that I need to go to? That would be incredible. And that's what I want us to be striving for together as a church. So as we do leave here today, what is our verdict? Do we know what we need or are we gonna let God show us what we need? Are we gonna, go, are we gonna let God show us the people we need to surround ourselves with? So let us be those who are inquiring of the Lord day in and day out. Let us be those who are surrounding ourselves, who have great valor and courage. And let us be those who are submissive to Christ. Amen.